Christ the true and better. house. Amen? Amen. It's the Lord's day to be in the Lord's house. What a great thing. We couldn't be in a better place. Amen? Amen. 
Man, we're glad you're here this morning. I'm going to uh, open us in prayer in just a moment. If you'll just remain st standing for that, a couple of announcements. I want y'all to pray for my family. Uh, my wife, Gina, has left me. <laughs> and uh, we all knew it was coming as soon as the grandbaby was born. We knew that was, we knew that was coming. So she, she is actually, she was here this morning, and she is on her way uh, as we speak going up to spend this week with, uh, with Jordan. Ben's going back to work, so uh, she'll be up there to help, help Jordan with uh, a little Shiloh this week. So I'll be getting a lot of pictures, but y'all pray for her this week. And then I want you to pray for uh, John Egger's dad, uh, Dr. Egger. Um, just, he, he's just in a, a very serious condition right now up in Indiana. And uh, they're, they're working to try to get him off of a, a vent. So pray for Dr. Egger and pray for that family. Um, Dave Callen, many of you know Dave Callen. Dave took a fall Friday evening off of a ladder, and uh, he has a, a compression fracture of his C3 vertebrae in his, in his neck. Now, he's doing much, much better. I saw him last night in the hospital. Uh, he's got to see a neurosurgeon today, not for, they don't believe there's anything needed anymore, but the, the doctor needs to clear him before he can go and give him direction, instruction, what to do now. Uh, but be praying for him. And then I wanted you to pray for Nikki and her family as uh, as her grandmother up in Georgia went home to be with the Lord yesterday. So pray for them in this time as well. So let's, uh, y'all join me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for um, your goodness to us, Lord, your love for us. We can never, ever, 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 ever question your love, Lord. You, you've proven your love for us clearly uh, 2,000 years ago when you sent your own son to come and take on the form of a man to become a part of his own creation and to live a sinless life, and then to go to the cross of Calvary to take our place on that cross, to bear our sin on that cross, to pay the penalty for our sin. And uh, Lord, he died on that cross for us. He was buried, and three days later, he rose again. And uh, with that, he won victory over he death, hell, sin, and the grave, and uh, made a way for us to be reconciled to you, our Father, and, and to, to be made right. And not in our sinlessness, because we're not sinless, but in his sinlessness and his righteousness. When we are born again, we put on his righteousness. And Lord, that's what you see. And we thank you, God. We thank you for that. And you've, you just, we just thank you for loving us so much. Father, I, I pray that you'll be with us today. Be with each of these needs. I pray for safety for Gina. I pray for Dr. Egger. God, that you just bring the, the touch that's needed. We pray your will be done in his life. Be with his family. Comfort them at this time. Lord, give wisdom to the doctors. And Father, we do. We pray, we pray that your will would be done. And if that is to touch and heal him, Lord, we'll praise you. And if it is otherwise, God, we're going to trust you and we're going to praise you. But, Lord, we're asking uh, for his touch, uh, your touch and his healing. Lord, be with Brother Dave Callen. We ask you to touch him and bring healing. And pray he'll be able to get out of the hospital today and get home. And uh, we just pray there won't be anything lasting uh, from this, any, any problems that would linger. But, Lord, I pray you'd bring him to full uh, healing in this situation. And, Lord, for Nikki and her family, we just ask for comfort for them that, that uh, Lord, I'm thankful for the testimony of her salvation. And, uh, Lord, because of that, we don't grieve as those who have no hope. There's grief, but our grief is different. Our grief is a grief that there's hope, and we'll see them again. And, uh, Lord, we just thank you for that hope. I pray you bring peace and comfort to the family now. Just minister to them and, Lord, even through them and to others uh, connected to this family that, that the gospel may go forth to them. Lord, I pray that you'll be with us today as we gather and we meet around your word. Uh, Lord, may we, may we truly in this time of worship, may, may we focus on your goodness and what you've done for us. And as we sing these songs of praise, may our hearts uh, join in in this. May we truly engage in spirit and in truth as we worship the risen Savior. Lord, we're not, we're not, we, it should not be glum this morning. It should not be glib. It should not be a, a situation where we have to even be prompted to worship. Our hearts ought to be full this morning because of what you have done for us. May we think on that for a few moments and just with hearts that are grateful and thankful, may we sing out this morning and worship you, Lord, uh, from, from, with our whole heart and from the depths of our heart. Father, I just pray that you'll bless this worship time and then bless as we go to your word. May, may you teach us from it this morning and draw us closer to you. Lord, it's just a great day to be in your house and we're thankful for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. All right, quick question. Is there, uh, I want to, I just want to see if there's anyone that's visiting. I look around, I see, I see mostly home folks. I think I see all home folk, but 
I want to see if there's anyone that's visiting with us this morning. Today is your very first time to visit with us here at First Baptist Geneva. Is there anyone, if, if you're visiting with us very first time, just slip your hand up. All right, I didn't think I, I saw anyone uh, new, but uh, see some returning guests, and we're grateful for you. We're glad you're here with us this morning. Well, we're going into a um, couple of things I'm going to announce, and then we're going into a, a new season. Uh, but first, let me, let me announce this. There's some flyers out here. This Friday at 9 a.m., we're going to have a, a Geneva community prayer meeting here at our church. Sheriff's Department, Sheriff has a, a faith-based community team. And uh, they, they reach out, they do a lot of things within the faith community. And uh, they reached out to us and said, Pastor, would you be willing to host just a simple prayer meeting uh, in the church? And, uh, and gave us a date, a couple of dates that might would work for the sheriff. Uh, but they, they said, you know, you, you can lead everything. You can lead the prayers. You can lead the, the music. You can, you can have all of that within your church. You handle that. And uh, all they ask is for Sheriff Lima to have an opportunity to share with the community. So uh, we're going we're gonna to do that 9 a.m. Uh, Sunday morning. Jim, Brother Jim has agreed to, uh, he's worked his schedule out so that he can be here. And uh, he'll help with our music. We'll have a couple of songs. We'll have some prayers. And uh, I'm probably going to give a little exhortation. Uh, to those that are here from the Word of God, and then we'll let Sheriff, Sheriff Lima share with the folks of Geneva. You know, uh, it's just in this, this state of recovery in this time of uh, just dealing with another one of these disasters that, that have hit us. So if you're available Friday morning at 9 o'clock and want to come and support that and be a part of that, we invite you and would welcome you to do that. Um, another thing is it's, it's Operation Christmas Child Season again. Right? It, it seems like we just finished this, but it seemed like it was just New Year's, right? It seemed like the New Year just rolled in, and here we are late October, not even early October, late October already. Uh, but we want to we share a video with you. I'll share some instruction on what's coming up with Operation Christmas Child. <laughs> Children open their boxes. You can hear the laughter, the cheer. Each gift brings a joy to their heart. Jesus said, let the little children come to me. I want the children to know that Jesus Christ is alive, and he'll come into each and every heart that invites him. The mission of Operation Christmas Child is to share the gospel with children around the world. Every shoebox gift is delivered with a verbal and written proclamation of the gospel in more than 100 countries every year. Jesus loves you. This is an evangelism project, and it all starts with a very simple shoebox gift. Volunteers are really the heart of who we are and what we do. When we pack the boxes, it's a reflection, a little glimpse of God's love that we're pouring out. When you pack the box, pray. We never know how God is going to use that box. They go by plane, they go by riverboat, they go by motorbikes. These shoe boxes go to children. It's one of the most isolated areas of the world. Your shoe box goes from you filling it full of toys to all ends of the earth to share the name of Jesus Christ. This box gives us a chance to show them that there is a light, there is a truth. After receiving shoebox gifts, children are invited to a 12-lesson discipleship program, The Greatest Journey. The child is discipled, not only know God, but make God known to others. They started to know the power of prayer. They want to know more. From this, we are seeing lives transformed for the kingdom of God. cuando me dieron mi regalo a, a través de la iglesia. Solo Dios me tocó y sentí en mi corazón algo fuerte. 
te había yo sumergí el pecado mío desde hace tiempo y yo no puedo regresar atrás. A mí me encanta compartir lo que es la Biblia con mi hermanito pequeño, Yalil. Y yo le digo a la gente, amistades, que busquen a Dios. When I was 14 years old, I started teaching my first The Greatest Journey lesson. If I shared the gospel to them, I really, really hope that they share the gospel with everyone they know. The heart of Operation Christmas Child is evangelism, discipleship, and multiplication. Because we bring gifts to the children, the mothers and the fathers accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. In every church, we are teaching them how to reach out to their neighbors. Operation Christmas Child became the answer from God. Children are taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. And it's time for us to go where no one else went, so the gospel can cover this earth just the way the water covered the ocean. Let's pray for the outreach to continue. It has to be our burden to reach them with the gospel. Millions of children around the world are being impacted by these simple shoebox gifts. So we need to keep packing those boxes and continue to pray for the children around the world as we begin to disciple them. God bless you. Thank you. Amen. Amen. So we've had a little bit going on. Normally we would have already started promoting uh, Operation Christmas Child, but with the renovations, with the hurricane and all that, some this, this kind of got pushed back. So we're four weeks today. Our goal right now is to receive those boxes four weeks today. That's plenty of time. It's plenty of time. We're getting on. There are boxes out in the foyer. There's some boxes out here to the side. You can go ahead and get those, pick those up, and take them home, get those started, put together and stuff. Uh, but we'll receive those beginning on Wednesday night, November the 13th, through Sunday morning, November the 17th. 17th will be the last night we'll re the day we'll receive those. But bring them in when you got them ready, the 13th through the 17th. You can bring them in. We can put them on the stage or in front of the stage. We'll have a special time of prayer for them. Um, there's a they don't charge you to send a box, but the cost is $10 involved with that. So if you, you, you choose to give that $10 to help with that, to help with the cost, that, that's what they would ask you to do. They don't require it, but they would ask you to do that. And what we're going to do this year, instead of sticking it in the box as we've done in the past, my fear is put a call, we put something in a box and it gets missed or it gets lost. So what we're going to do is we'll have a, one, of these, one of these boxes we use for the offering. We'll have that down here out front. So when you bring those in, you can just drop your... your money in for that. We'll compile all that, one single check, and we'll send a check from the church to Samaritan's Purse to cover those. Um, so that's, a, that's a, just a, a great ministry to be a part of. Now, a few things I want to announce because we've got some things that we're going to do at the very end, so we'll announce these now and we'll be done with this part. Can I just tell you I hate announcements? I'm just going to tell you I hate them. I hate them. And, and, and sometimes we have to announce some things, but I don't want to announce everything. I can't announce everything every week, but as things come up, we, we will do that. But I, I just, I, I hate the way it pulls away from the service, but I, but I need to communicate a few things. Young adults are going to meet tonight, the young adult ministry. That's at 6 o'clock over in the fellowship hall. So they'll gather tonight. Uh, also to the, today, earlier they started. Two classes started, and I hope, you, I hope you were in them if you were planning to come. First was Todd's 30 Days to Understanding the Bible. There's still some availability in there. If you want to get involved with that, you can. But that meets during small group hour in the far back, the far side of the fellowship in the very back corner. That, that, room, uh, that class meets. 30 Days to Understanding the Bible. If you got questions, see Todd. See Todd there, he'll answer any questions you have. Patrick Duncan started his new class today on Job. They met in the conference room this week. That's not going to be his permanent meeting place, but maybe, maybe another week, we're not sure. Depends on if we can get his room cleared out. If we get his room ready, we'll send an email out so you'll know. But if you, uh, if you didn't join that class this morning and you're interested in it, that's meeting uh, back here. That's uh, Patrick's class teaching on the book of Job. And then tomorrow night, men, We'll be here at 6 o'clock right here in the sanctuary for our men's uh, prayer band. And then uh, I have a quick question for you, okay? If you raise your hand, you're not committing to anything, okay? You're not, you're not obligated. I'm not going to come looking for a check today, okay? But I'm trying to do a survey a little bit. How many of you would be interested in a marriage retreat next year? 
would be interested in going to a marriage retreat next year. Okay, several hands. That's good. <laughs> What's that? Uh, good, good. We should all be doing that. If you're, the, the, here's the people who need a marriage retreat. The only people who need a marriage retreat are those who are married. All right, if you're married, I'd encourage you. We're, we're working on plans. Right now, I'm looking at early April. We've got a great speaker already lined up. He's available those dates. Um, so we're looking at early April of doing, doing that and getting away somewhere that's within driving distance. We're going to have a good time. Uh, have some free time to get away, but uh, it, would be a, it would be a profitable, profitable weekend. So at least I have an idea there's some folks who would be interested in that. We'll get plans together and let you know on that very soon, okay? Praise the Lord. Pastor Aaron, team, Amen. lead us. If you're able to, let's stand together. You know, uh, as we were talking about, we're going through Colossians in our student ministry, and we talked today about how knowledge of the Lord never is an end in Christianity, but it leads to an end, which is worship. And so you guys have figured out the worship cheat code. You get to come to small groups, learn about this great God, and then come here and, and pour affections upon him, right? What a great opportunity. So you guys have figured it out. Don't tell the first service yet, okay? <laughs> Let's sing with Nikki. She leads us.
Did, did, is that why your mouth is shut? I see some of you. I don't think I see you. I see you, right? Uh, the Lord says to St. Patrick Conrad, I didn't make that up, right? I don't think you did make that up, right? That's in the scripture. The Lord says for you to bring your voice to him. But I guess he hasn't done enough for some of you guys, right? So you're going to sit there and be stoic, right? Is that true? I think the Lord's done plenty this week. Amen. Let us respond to him today the way he asked for us to. Amen. No praise. He is high enough. that we stand upon. Lord, those are given to all. But Lord, we have received your grace, your kindness, your goodness, your purpose. And so Lord, let us be people today that honor and praise you with all of our lives. Lord, not just songs, but Lord, more deeper. We're looking deeper at the hearts too. So Lord, let us bring this all before you today as an offering. Lord, you're building a spiritual house among us, a praise and worship uh, to honor and glorify you. 
In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, all God's people said, amen. Amen, beloved. Feel free to grab a seat. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, if you have your Bible, and I hope you do, turn to the, uh, the book of John, the Gospel of John in the New Testament, the fourth of the Gospels there. Uh, we're going to begin a new series today. This, this, this will, will probably extend to time. The great thing about spe- preaching through a book is I can always detour off of that and jump out and do something else and come back in, pick up where we left off. But man, I'm, I'm really excited about this study in the, the Gospel of John. It's probably... It's one of my two favorite books in the, in the New Testament, and uh, I'll explain to you here in a little bit why I think, why I think it's, it's been my favorite book for so long, uh, but that's where we're going to go. So we're at the Gospel according to John with an introduction this morning. Next week, we'll begin our verse-by-verse study of this. We'll look at a few different things in here this morning just in the way of, uh, again, of introduction. Well, as we get started here in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 27, Solomon asked... A, 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 a deep question, an important question. It was, it was a good question as he dedicated the temple. He said, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Now see, God's glory had dwelled in the tabernacle. And if you go back to Exodus chapter 40, you look at verse 34, it said, then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So the Lord dwelt there. And he also dwelt in the temple. 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 10 and 11, it says, And it came to pass when the priest came out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. But here's the thing. The glory, that glory had departed because of the disobedience of Israel. If you go to the book of Ezekiel, you can read there several verses in, in the book of Ezekiel allude to this and tell this, this part of the story. But Ezekiel chapter 9 verse 3 says, Now the glory of the Lord of Israel had gone up from the cherub where it had been to the threshold of the temple. The glory of the Lord had left. And so the question Solomon asked was a great question. Will, the, will God indeed dwell on earth? And then there's this marvelous thing that happens. The glory of God came to his people again in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. The writers of the four Gospels have given us, really they've given us only what I would call snapshots. I mean, they're just, just a Polaroid of the Lord's life here on earth. When you, when you think about all that could have been written and all that would have had to have been written to write a complete biography of the Lord, it could never be written. In fact, John in chapter um, 21, verse 25 He says, and there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Now imagine if you were to walk with the Lord for one day. Every word he said was the word of God. Everything that he did was an action of God. He is God on earth. He's God in flesh. And, and, and so if you imagine trying to record all of that, so what the Gospels do is they give us a snapshot of the life of Christ. Now we look at the Gospels, you know, Matthew uh, wrote, with his, he wrote with his fellow Jews in mind. That's who he was writing to. And he emphasized that Jesus of Nazareth had fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies. You know, Matthew basically says that Jesus is king of the Jews. That's, that's, that's what he was saying. Mark focuses on Jesus as the suffering servant, and he declares the works of Jesus. Luke wrote his gospel for the Greeks and focused on Jesus as the savior of the world who seeks the lost. Now, Matthew emphasizes his kingship. Mark emphasizes his servanthood. Uh, Luke emphasizes his manhood, the fact that he was God, he was man, he is God, but he was man. And then John focuses on his Godhood. And so it is given to John, so the Holy Spirit inspires John. His job in writing his gospel is to write a book for both Jews and Gentiles presenting Jesus as the Son of God. That's, that's the goal of his gospel, the gospel of John, is, is to, to declare and to present Jesus as the Son of God. Now we understand, and we really know from his writing, that John had Gentiles uh, in mind as well as Jews, because he often interpreted the Jewish words and customs for his readers. As he's writing, he would have been writing things that the Jew would read and would know right offhand exactly what that is. But he interprets. And if he's interpreting, then we know he's not writing that to a solely Jewish audience. 
he wouldn't have had to interpret. So he's writing to Jews, but he's also writing to Gentiles because he provides some interpretation. A few of those verses, chapter 1, verse 38. Then Jesus turned and seeing them following, said to them, What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi. Now in parentheses, says, Which is to say, when translated, teacher. Okay? So someone else reading that, well, what's a rabbi? What's that mean? And, and so John is writing that, which is to say when translated teacher. Uh, chapter 1, verse 41 and 42, he first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, again in parentheses, which is translated the Christ. Verse 42, and he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, you are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas which is translated a stone. Verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 2. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. So we see here again and again and again, and there's other verses that do this, but John provides interpretation. So we understand John's not just writing to the Jew. He's not just writing to the Gentile. He's writing to Jew and Gentile alike. And, and so he provides some layering there for us and some context for those who may not understand some of those words. His emphasis to the Jews was that Jesus not only fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies, but also fulfilled the types. Okay, So we, we learn in here, John's writing is going to tell us that Jesus is the Lamb of God. They would have understood the Lamb of God. The Jews would. And he shows how Jesus fulfilled that. He's going to show about how Jesus was the ladder from heaven to earth. He is the new temple, and he gives a new birth. In John chapter 3, we learn of the new birth. He is the serpent lifted high. Jesus is that serpent lifted high. He's going to teach us that. And he is the bread of God that came down from heaven in John chapter 6. So these are things that John wrote, emphasizing these things to the Jews that the Jews would have understood, and he's going to make clear presenting Christ in those things that they would have clearly understood. Now, the first three Gospels major on describing events in the life of Christ. John emphasized the meaning of these events. As you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there's a lot of its history. It flows like history, a lot of retelling of things that actually happened. But John is going to spend more time telling us why these things happened. What was the meaning behind these things? What was behind what Jesus said? One example of this is that all four Gospels record the feeding of the 5,000, but only John records Jesus' sermon on the bread of life, which followed that miracle, and then he interpreted it for the people. He, he shared with them what that means. That's the kind of things that we're going to be learning. We're going to go deeper in, in this, in the, in the things that Jesus said. So number one uh, here, sub-point here would be, we're going to look at John's background. So, so many would ask, some, a new student to the Bible may say, well, who is this John? Uh, who is John? Or which John is he? I know there's, there's this John, there's that John. Who is it? Well, let me clarify that for you. All right, first of all, it's not John Mark. Many of you would know the name John Mark. He wrote the Gospel of Mark. And John Mark was the nephew, nephew of Barnabas. Um, he was the one who went with Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey. They get out on the journey and he abandons them. We don't know why. Uh, there's speculation, different reasons why. But we don't know for sure why he left. But he came to a point and he turns around and he goes back home. We don't know if a family member was sick. We don't know if he got homesick. We don't know what it was. But we do know this. We know Paul didn't like it. Paul, Paul wasn't happy with John Mark in, in this situation. And it was, it was because of this and, it, you know, John Mark became the subject later on of a, a, a major disagreement between Paul and Barnabas. They're going on a second missionary journey. journey. Barnabas wants to take John Mark along. Paul says, now we've been down that road. We did that once before. We're not doing that again. He doesn't want to go. They have a, a big dust up and they decide we'll go separate ways. Barnabas takes takes uh, John Mark, and we know that Paul takes uh, Silas. And, and then, you know, God used all that. He used all that. So this is the John Mark that we're talking about. Later, John Mark was restored to ministry. Barnabas, being his uncle, uh, being in the ministry, he poured into John Mark. He was restored to ministry if restoration was needed. I'm not even sure that was the case. We're not sure what the situation was for sure. It wouldn't die on a hill of anything there. But we do know that whatever the situation was, he was restored into ministry. And he ultimately proved to be very profitable to Paul and to the kingdom of God in his service to the Lord. 
So, so whatever the situation was, God ended up using John Mark in a great way. This is not the John who wrote the gospel of, of John. Now, it's not also the other, another you may, uh, some would ask is, was it, was it John the Baptist? Well, John the Baptist was a cousin of Jesus. His mother, Elizabeth, and Mary were sisters, so they were first cousins. Um, John the Baptist uh, lived in the wilderness and ate locusts and honey. We know, that John, most people would know John the Baptist. They know who he is. Uh, he was the one sent by the Lord to prepare the, for the coming of the Lord. And uh, it was John the Baptist that said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It was John the Baptist who proclaimed that. It was John the Baptist who baptized the Lord Jesus. And it was John the Baptist who was, bab- uh, was beheaded by, by King Herod. So that, that's John the Baptist. That is not the John who wrote the gospel according to John. So who is that John? Well, it's John the Apostle. It's John the Apostle. He was one of the 12, one of the 12 disciples, one of the apostles. He, is, uh, he along with James, were sons of Zebedee. You've probably heard that, the sons of Zebedee, James and John. Also called, who knows what else they were called, the sons of... Sun, hey, y'all, y'all thundered that out in unison. The sons of thunder. Yeah, they were, man, they were in call down fire, man. They were, they were, they were fiery guys. But this is James and John. And, and so John was also one of, of Jesus. He was in Jesus' inner circle of three. Now, uh, you, so you had Peter, James, and John who were in that inner circle. Now, here's a leadership principle that the Lord teaches us. You know, we can't, even I as a pastor... As much as I would love to touch and influence every single person personally, a church our size, we're a little over, we're a little over 200 members now. We're, our attendance is, well, our attendance is probably over 200, so we may be, be beyond that now. But um, we've kind of topped that 200. Bucks. I can't personally touch and pour into, in, in a personal way, every person. And Jesus, in his, in his humanness, could not as either. He ministered to many. He spoke to many and he shared. But he had a smaller group of disciples who followed him around. There was a group of disciples that followed around. But then there was a smaller group, the 12, that he had hand-chosen, that he was pouring into and investing in. And, 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 but even beyond that, those 12, there was the three that was the inner circle, that they had more, more private time, more intimate time, more, more personal time with Jesus. And it was those three, Peter, James, and John, who, man, they, they witnessed the glory of the transfiguration. They were there to witness the agony of Gethsemane. They were, you know, John, for sure, was near the foot of the cross. He was, near, he was so near that he could have an interaction with the Lord Jesus while he was there on the cross. And then Jesus commended his mother to John's care from the cross. So we know John, this John, was right there. He is, he is the cousin of Jesus. His mother, tradition says, his mother was uh, Salome, and, uh, and uh, she would have been the sister of Mary. So again, here you have a first cousin, someone who grew up with the Lord, who, who probably spent time with him as a child, spent time with him as a, as a teenager, uh, in, in, into those years pre-ministry. But then he's one of the 12, and then ultimately he's one of the three. He was a close close, not only family member, but friend of the Lord Jesus Christ. He spent very, very close time with him. In fact, the scriptures, John doesn't talk about himself when he writes and say, John, you know, me, I, he, he says it many, many times in this you read, he says the, the disciple whom Jesus loved. There was a special relationship there, a close, close relationship there that John had with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, John lived through an incredible time, an incredible time. We think about, you know, we think about sometimes we, we, we meet somebody that's, you know, older, 90, 100 years old, and we think what they've lived through. Folks, if you're alive today, you've lived through incredible, incredible stuff. I mean, from... from the, 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 the international travel, I think back, this was before I was born, but I think back to the, the five missionaries who went down to Ecuador, Nate Saint and Jim Elliott, and Roger Uterin, there's five of those guys. But I don't think they all five traveled together, but I know when Jim Elliott left, I think he left San Diego on a boat, and it took like a month or two to get down to South America. It's a long trip. It took a long time to get down there. Folks, we can be in 30 hours, we can be halfway around the world. 30-hour trip, I can be in Central Asia 
on the ground in Central Asia in 30 hours. It's crazy what we've seen. We, we see the, the, the increase in technology. We've seen those kind of things. It's crazy the time that we live in. doesn't compare at all with the things that John witnessed and he saw in his lifetime. Let's look at those. See, John lived through this incredible time. And imagine with me these things. So in John's days, Jesus, the Son of God, became the Son of Man. He had been incarnated... God made flesh there at Bethlehem, born, born of a virgin. He became, he was incarnated, he became a man right there, took on a man's suit, became part of his own creation there at Bethlehem. He was baptized in the Jordan, tempted and proved sinless in the wilderness. He healed the sick, he healed the leprous, and he raised the dead. He made the blind to see, the deaf to hear, the dumb to speak, and the lame to walk. He turned water into wine. He walked on the stormy sea. He, he, he fed multitudes with a, just a handful, with a few fish and, 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 and unleavened wafers of bread. He taught God's truth in stimulating, memorable ways. He was God, he was God manifest in the flesh. He is God in flesh. And he is love incarnate. That's what he was. This is what John saw. John saw as he was betrayed, falsely accused, wrongly convicted, mocked, manhandled, beaten and abused and crucified. John saw as he was buried, but he also saw when he, he rose victoriously from the tomb. Amen? John saw this. He, 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 he saw as the Lord ascended to heaven. And John had Jesus' word that he was coming back. John records this. Years later, after these memories, uh, all of these memories, you know, years later, we're talking about years, 60 years or so later, after the Lord's ascension to heaven, we have John, who's still alive, an old man at this point, and, and, and these memories, all of the memories of the things that he's witnessed and he's seen, they're all there, they're in his mind, they're in his, in his heart, John was Jesus' human cousin and for some three and a half years, his best friend. And John knew the truth about the Lord Jesus Christ as did perhaps no other person on earth. Would have had the knowledge and the, the understanding and, the, and all of this that John had at this point. John had personally witnessed as the, the, the Christian church was born... It had been born on the Jewish festival of Pentecost in a crowded upper room in Jerusalem just 10 days after Jesus ascended into heaven. John was there when the Holy Spirit had come like a mighty rushing wind with like, like cloven tongues of fire. And the disciples had been baptized into one body, that, that mysterious body, that mystical body, that, that body of Christ, the church was birthed there. John was there. John had known all of the disciples all of the apostles, all the early church members. He knew them all. He was a charter member, and now he's the last one. He had seen the church grow from 120 to over 3,000 in a single day. He had seen the church take root and spread until now, near the end of the first century. It was reaching to all the world. It was, it was spreading. No living soul knew that soul better than John. And all the books at this point, at this point now, and we're talking somewhere between 85 A.D. and 100 A.D., all the books of the New Testament have been written except for John's gospel, his three letters, and the Revelation. And now the Lord is going to go to work in inspiring John in his writings. Now the second point we're going to look at here is this introduction of John's gospel. So... Um, the last gospel is the last gospel written, and it's written somewhere, like I said, some speculate it was between 85 and 90 A.D. Others think it was 90 to 100 A.D. Regardless, we're talking 55 to 70 years after the Lord ascended into heaven that John now is writing this. So he's had all of this time. He's seen all of these things. He's experienced this, and for all these years, it's just brewed within him. It's just, it's in his memory. It's in his mind. It's in his heart. It's all of that. And, and, and so John now, the Lord is going to, inspire him to write. 
It's not, it's not one of the, if, if you're familiar with this, you understand that the book of John is not one of the synoptic gospels because the difference is they're all similar in the structure, in the content, and even in the wording. When you read through Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you find a lot of the same things. That, that, that They're very similar in the writing. All of that, as you read them, sometimes you can read one, you read another one, you go, I, I mean, it's almost like I'm, it's repetitive, right? It's different with John. As soon as you open the book of John and start reading the book of John, you realize that there's something different about the book of John. Uh, it's very obviously different from the others. There's no genealogy. There's no manger scene. There's no childhood of Christ. There's no baptism, no temptation, no Mount of Transfiguration, no Garden of Gethsemane. None of those things do we find in John's gospel. There are only a few special uh, miracles chosen by John as signs. He did record some miracles, but there were miracles that he, these special ones that he chosen as signs. And it's in John's Gospels that we find the famous I am statements of the Lord Jesus. And then there's other discourses that we find nowhere else but here in his, in his Gospel. And so it's here that we're going to see where Jesus says, I am the bread of life in John 6, 35. I am the light of the world, John 8, 12. I am the door, John 10, 9. I am the good shepherd, John chapter 10. I am the resurrection and the life in John chapter 11. I am the way, the truth, and the life in John 14. And he says, I am the vine in John 15. And so these are all things, these famous I am statements of the Lord Jesus. And we get to study these now and learn from these and glean truth from this now. In John's gospel, we find no scribes, no lepers, no publicans, no parables, and no demoniacs. We probably find Democrats um, and, and probably some Republicans by different names. We find some, we find some liberals and some lunatics. Uh, so politics was alive and well back then too, Okay. Um, some writers have observed this. Now, some have said this about the, the book of John. It said that it would almost seem that John set, uh, sits with a copy of Luke's gospel open before him, deliberately leaving out things that Luke puts in and putting in things that Luke leaves out. I think that's very helpful. Luke had given us that. I don't, we don't need that. John says, we don't need to, I don't need to retell that. And the Holy Spirit says, but no, but tell them this. Don't tell them that. They've already got that. Now tell them this. So Luke had written to show that Jesus was the Son of Man. John is writing to show that Jesus is the Son of God. And that is the one major theme that runs throughout John's Gospel. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And if you commit yourself to Him, He will give you eternal life. That is the theme. You want a theme for the book? You want, to, you want to go, all right, what is this book about? What is, we began to study this, what is John going to tell us? What is, he, what is the purpose of him writing this book? John 20, 31 really tells us the purpose of this book. Again, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and if you commit yourself to him, he will give you eternal life. John 20, 30 says, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written. What John has written now, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. He says, believe that Jesus is the Christ. Now, what John's talking about there is more than a head knowledge. Okay, you got to understand this. This is we, we, we so often today in our culture, our the word believe. We we, we well, I believe that it's it's head knowledge. Y'all know the distance between heaven and hell? Who said that? That's exactly right. The distance between heaven and hell is it can be as short as eighteen inches because you can have a head knowledge of all these things and not a heart knowledge. And when I talk about a heart, I'm not talking about, you know, one of the things that we've done a disservice of is this thing. Uh, we, we, want our, we want to ask Jesus into our heart. Well, it doesn't really work that way. It's not about asking Jesus into my heart. Now, we understand the concept of I have a Jesus-shaped hole in my life. I have something that only he can fill. But I think we mess up our kids sometimes. We go, well, you got to ask Jesus into our heart. So Jesus is a little guy, and we're going to plug him into my heart, and that's what's going to complete me. Folks, that's not, the, that's not the idea here. The idea is when we talk about, you know, when we talk, we're not asking him into my heart. We're asking him into my life. 
We're asking him to forgive me of my sin and come into my life. But here's the problem. We have a head knowledge. Many have a head knowledge. Well, yeah, I believe, I believe in Jesus. I believe he existed. I, you know, I believe he may have been the Son of God. They believe. They might even believe all those things. They say they believe those things. But do they believe? The biblical meaning of believe is to trust. It is faith. Do they put their faith in that? I believe. Well, but I am continue trusting my way. I'm going to do it my way. I can do it with good works. You know what? I can join the church. I can get baptized. I can go on a mission trip. I can give some money away. I can do all these different things. And, and the idea, some have this idea that the scales are like this. Well, here's my sin, but I'm going to keep piling good stuff over here on this side. I'm just going to pile it and pile it and pile it. And eventually, the scale's going to tip over in my favor, and it's going to outweigh my sin. Folks, it doesn't work that way there ain't enough old women to walk across the street in the whole world if you walk them across the rest of your life to to, for good deeds for you to go to heaven there's not enough money for you to give if there is there's a lot of guys that think they 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 might have the money they think i could give all my billions and and boy i'm entrepreneurial i'm god surely god will let me in it doesn't work that way Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He he says that in John. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. He's the only way. He's the only way. And it takes this. It takes me figuring out that I can't do it myself. I'm a sinner. My sin is separated from me from God. I can't do anything. And when I, when I realize that, when God reveals to me my sin, he convicts me of my sin, and I turn from my sin, I repent, a change of mind. I can't do it, only he can. And I turn to him, and I look to Jesus, and I call upon him to save my soul. And I put my faith and my trust in him. Let me do it this way. This is the ark. It's the same way. It's the same. Salvation is the same as it was for Noah, in a sense. Think about this. Noah spent all those years building the ark. God gave him the plan, said there's a flood coming. I want you to build an ark. Noah gets through. He builds the ark. And God says, Noah, get on the boat. And Noah goes, um, you know, I don't know, Lord. Uh, you know, I built that thing. And uh, I know it was your instruction. And I did everything you said. But I, flood? What's a flood? I mean. We don't have rain. We don't. Have, we talking about water? You know, all this water. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I get it, Lord. I want to be obedient. I want to do all these good things for you. I want to be faithful to you. I wanted to work for you. But he says, Noah, get in the ark. If Noah doesn't get in the ark, what's going to happen? He's going to die. He's going to die in the judgment. He will not be able to stand in that. He will be dead. He will be dead. Noah has got to do what each of us have to do. That ark, Christ, that ark is a type of Christ. Folks, we have to believe into Christ in the same way that Noah had to believe into the ark. He had to have faith that would get him in the ark. I trust the vehicle, the method, the way that God has given me. Not only do I know it's there, I know there's a boat there. God said it'll float. I know it. I know it. I know there's a flood coming. He's told me. I know that, but I don't know. And it's not until Noah says, yes, Lord, I believe you. I trust you. And I'm going to trust the way you said. Folks, he said that Jesus Christ is the only way. He is the only way. He is the only way. And it is through our placing our faith and our trust in Christ alone that we are born again. This is what John wants us to know. Jesus is the Son of God. He is the only way. And he says, that these, the, but these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Folks, that's what this book is about. This book's going to be glorious as we read it, as we study this. And, we, and we're going to, Now, let me tell you, I, I think I told you it's, my, it's my, one of my favorite books. And I, as I was preparing, beginning this study, I finally realized why I like this book so much. See, here's the thing. John's language is Greek, 
but his thoughts are Hebrew. Okay, so that's, that's part of this. But here's the thing. John's language is simple. How many of you like simple Simple things, easy things. I like easy. I had a pastor who used to tell me, I mean, he was a whole lot more, he was a whole lot deeper than me. But he used to say, I'm just a cornbread preacher. He wanted to be a simple preacher. I'm just a cornbread. And I thought, man, if he's a cornbread, I mean, I'm like, a, I'm like a, just a, a hush puppy. You know, I'm just a, and that's all. John's language is simple. And his vocabulary is small. He doesn't have a huge vocabulary. In fact, there's about 15,000 words in the book. A little more than 15,000, I think. And there's about 1,100 words that he uses in the letter. 1,100 different words. That's not, not a whole lot of words for the letter he's written. But he doesn't write with big words. He doesn't write with eloquent speech. He, he writes with and uses very simple words. And he uses very simple sentences. Here's what's amazing. Is that the Holy Spirit inspired John to use his simple words... To put together these simple sentences that contain incredible truth and depth. And what's great about this book, you know, here's what I do. Sometimes somebody will say, you know, where should I start with reading the Bible? Where should I go first? I tell them John. I tell them John because it's a simple, easy book to read. Here's the thing. It's a book that's, that's simple. It's safe. A child can wade in the waters of John and understand and glean truth. And the deepest theologian can swim as deep as they want in the book of John. The concepts that are there are are deep. That's why I love this book so much. It's a book for everybody. And here's some of the words that John uses. His favorites, I guess. Father, the word father, speaking of God. 121 times. He speaks of my father 35 times. It's 150 over 150 times he uses father. He uses the word no. And there's two words for no. There's oida and uh, gnosko. Gnosko is a little more intimate knowledge. There's knowledge, there's an understanding, and then there's a more deeper uh, Gnosko will be a deeper, more intimate knowledge and understanding. And it's, uh, uh, he uses those two words 117 times. He w- uses the word believe 99 times. I think he wants us to believe. World, 79 times. Jews, 71. Abide, 41. Life, 36. Light, 30, uh, 23. He uses the word love in its various forms 57 times. And he uses the word truth in its various cognates 66 times. These are the words he used. They're simple words. But he puts them together in simple sentences that convey incredible truth. And as we close up, and Pastor Aaron, you can come. You can come forward. Is he out smoking? He was out smoking. (laughs) I'm kidding, kids. He was not. He was not. I realize I have to make sure of clarity. He was not. Okay. Pastor Aaron wouldn't do that. Um, Warren Wiersbe said this about studying the book of John, the gospel of John. He said, please come to this book with the heart and mind of a worshiper. John did not simply write a book. He painted exciting pictures. These pages are filled with images such as the lamb, the door, the shepherd, the new birth, the light and darkness, the water of life, bread, blindness, seeds, and dozens more. Wiersbe says, use your sanctified imagination. Y'all heard that idea before? A little different wordage, but he says, use your sanctified imagination as you study And the gospel of John will become a new book to you. And remember, you're not studying a book. You're seeing a person. And we beheld his glory, full of grace and truth, John 1.14. Folks, as we read this, my, my encouragement to you, my challenge to you, is to read this book in color. Read it in 3D. Use your sanctified imagination. See the things that are going on. Think Go as as deep as God will let you go in this. But see it in your mind. Let it it be real. Let it be in color as you do this. And I'm going to encourage you to, to, uh, this week, begin reading through John. 
you may decide, I'm going to read through the book of John for the next month. I, I encourage that. Take a book, read through it every day. It, 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 a smaller book, you can read through it in, in, a, in a day. Maybe a larger book, you read five, six chapters a day, and you read through it, and then you rotate that around. You read through that book in a month. You do that. Here's what's amazing is as you do that, you, you begin to see things that you didn't see in the first, the second, the fifth, the tenth reading. You start seeing things. God starts revealing things to you that you didn't see before. But I encourage you to start reading through it. So as we study through this book, your mind will already be engaged with the book of John, okay? And uh, as, as we allow God to work in our hearts and our lives. I think it's going to be, it gives us the opportunity, I think, to really have a great time of worshiping around the word and seeing Jesus in a new way. This morning as we have our, our response time here, our invitation, you know, this morning there may be somebody sitting here. I, I told the first group, you may, there may be somebody who's sitting here who's lost. You think you're okay. You've convinced yourself you're okay. I, you know, I prayed in an altar at a revival meeting when I was eight. I, you know, I, I prayed with somebody in a Sunday school class. I prayed when I was at home by myself sometime. Maybe, maybe, maybe you had an experience, but an experience doesn't necessarily mean salvation. The most important thing is, have you truly been born again? And this morning, if the Holy Spirit of God convicts your heart and says, you know what, I don't, I don't know for sure that I'm saved. That's not something you want to play around with. Well, I'm like 99% sure that I'm saved. I don't want to bet anything on that 1%. This morning, listen to what God tells you. Let him speak to your heart. Lord, am I, am I right with you? Have I truly been born again? This morning, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, I plead with you, come down. Oh, but people will think, you know, they, they know I go to church here. They know I'm a member. Man, they'll be, they'll be like, they'll, that'd be so embarrassing. No, the only thing that would be embarrassing is you die and go to hell because you didn't want to come forward and deal with God about an issue that he's dealing with you on. This morning, if you need to be born again, I, I plead with you, move, respond to what he's doing in your life. Christian, I don't know what's going on in your life. If I ask if there was... Needs in this room represented every hand ought to go up because we're a needy people. And so this morning as we have this time of just responding, uh, we have a great altar here now. We've got a lot of space. Maybe this morning you just want to come down and talk to God. He knows what's going on in your life. He knows what you need. He knows what you need to give him. He knows what, uh, what, what you need to take from him. But respond to whatever he's doing. If there's a need, if you want somebody to pray with you, we'd gladly do that. We'd gladly do that. But as we stand in a moment to sing, uh, I encourage you to do whatever it is God's calling you to do. Father, we thank you for the book of John. We thank you for this man who, Lord, was, wow, what a, what a life he lived. And we really can't wait now to get into the book and to dig into the truths of, of what you inspired him to write. For, for those readers then, but also for us today. There is truth that is timeless. Lord, as we, as we get into your word, his book, the, the Gospel of John, just illuminate your word for us. Speak to our hearts. Teach us the deep truths from there. God, we'll praise you. We'll thank you for that. Lord, I don't know the hearts. I can't see the hearts. I see the, I see the folks sitting here. I know there's folks hurting. There are folks with financial needs, folks with spiritual needs, folks with mental needs, folks with health needs. There are, there are needs represented all over this room. Lord, you see the heart. You know the need. And I pray right now as we, as we respond in this invitation time, Father, if there's something we need to come cast upon you, we'll be obedient and do that. If there's something we need to come and confess to you, I pray we'll be obedient to do that. But may we not be concerned with who's sitting around us. May we be concerned about the one we're here worshiping. God, what you want us to do. If there's anyone that needs to be saved today, I pray you'd speak to their heart and they would step out and move. Come down and say, Preacher, I need Jesus. Father, would you bless now? In Jesus' name we pray. Now, as we uh, go to this song here in a moment, there's some that are they're already prepared to come forward they're to, to join this morning. If you want to go ahead and make your way down at this time, that'd be great. If you'll stand with us. Stand the music. When the music fades, and all is stripped away, and the sympathy comes, longing just to breathe, 
Amen. Amen. You may be seated and you may stand. Y'all come on up here. I've got some introductions for you this morning, church. Exciting day. I'm going to start with you, Miss Sue. This is Miss Susan Bresnahan. Do you go by Susan or Sue? Most people call me Sue, but my kids at school call me Miss Sue, so... Which do you prefer? I honestly don't care. Just don't call me late for dinner. Susan, I can be Sue. Sue. Okay. So this is this is Miss Sue Bresnahan, and uh, we've we've talked. She's been through the class. Miss Sue, have, you you are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone for your salvation. Is that correct? Yes. You've trusted Him. You've called on the name of the Lord. He saved your soul. Amen. And you've been scripturally baptized baptized after salvation by immersion in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Is that correct? All right. So Miss Susan wants to join by statement of faith. Uh, all in favor of receiving her into membership here at First Baptist Geneva, say amen. amen. Opposed, say no. Okay, I didn't think we'd have many. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Welcome, Miss Susan. Thank you. All right. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, let's do this. Let's do this. Uh, let's go here next. This is, well, no. Let's go here next. Miss Miss uh, Miss uh, Beverly Beverly Mason and. Uh, this is her grandson, Lennon, and Lennon is one of the smartest people I know. I mean, how old are you, Lennon? Thirteen. Thirteen? Yeah. He's thirteen. He's an old soul. <laughs> with a, with a, he's got a Ferrari engine under the hood, okay? You all know what I mean? I'm running a Pinto down here. This guy's got a, this guy's got a Ferrari engine, and Lennon knows the Lord, and he loves the Lord. Amen? Yeah. Lennon, you've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation. You're trusting in him and him alone to save your soul. Amen? Amen. He's the, he's the, the one who's going to take you to heaven and him alone. You've been scripturally baptized, correct? You've already been baptized. Okay. So Lennon, Lennon wants to come by way of statement of faith this morning. And uh, all in favor, say amen. amen. All opposed, same sign. 
All right. And then Miss Beverly, getting back to Beverly, your grandson Lynn in there, I know you're proud of. Miss mm-hmm. Beverly, uh, has, you have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, correct? Your faith, you're trusting in Christ and Christ alone to take you to heaven. And, um, but you told me you have not been, you've been baptized, you were sprinkled, so she's going to get baptized. <laughs> she told me, she said, I need to be baptized. So she's going to be baptized. We're going to dunk you. Yeah. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. So Miss Beverly has trusted Christ as her Savior. Now she wants to come. She's going to be baptized regardless, but uh, we want to receive her into membership, contingent on her baptism next Sunday morning. All in favor of that, say amen. amen. Anyone who doesn't like it, if you don't like it, if you don't like it, say, or, if you, or if you disagree, say boo. All right, I know there'll be no one. Praise the Lord. We're so excited. We had, um, I think we had six. Was it six individuals this morning, Aaron? Six that joined this morning. Three, three couples joined this morning, and 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 uh, so you three. That's nine that have joined our church today, and we're excited about that. So we'll have baptisms next uh, next uh, week. We'll baptize you next week. And uh, there may be some others. Look, there's some others. I've already seen fingers being pointed that need to be baptized. There's others that uh, very soon will offer another membership class. So if you've been attending and you're interested in becoming a member at First Baptist Geneva, we have a class that we offer. It's usually three or four weeks. Uh, and w- once you take that class, if you want to join, then you would, we would take the process further. You take it and you, you go, ah, this ain't the place for me. That's okay. You're not obligated to anything, but we require the class as a prerequisite to joining. And uh, these have all done that. Was the class good? Did you enjoy it? It's helpful. Very good. Amen. Well, if you're, if you're excited about that, let's, let's welcome them and, 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 uh, with another. <laughs> Praise the Lord. All right, so here's what we're going to do as we close out. Is, uh, would you all mind staying up here? You stay up here. I want y'all to come by and give them the right hand of fellowship. Greet them. Welcome them to the church. Introduce yourself. We'll, have, we'll test you later on names. Okay, so remember all their names. Get that out. But uh, fantastic. Man, what a gr- great day we've had. And uh, got a lot going on this week. Don't forget, guys, prayer band tomorrow night. Please come join us. Be here as we, as we lift up needs in prayer. And um, anything else? Pastor Aaron, anything you need to announce? Did y'all have a good time last night? Had a good time. Yeah. Everybody survived? Yeah. Okay. Mostly. Mostly. All right. All right, Ben, I'm going to call on you again, man. Ben Ald, if you'll stand up right there, if you'd just voice our prayer as we close our service this morning. Yes, ma'am. There's some, uh, for Operation Christmas Child, there's some in the foyer and there's some right out here behind the, the table. Yep. Thank you, Ben.